We have Dr. Mark Carter here from uh, um, Ad Astra to talk to us about the Vasimir Plasma Propulsion Engine. So thank you very much for coming. I've been asked to stall just a little bit while we get organized, but uh, I'm Mark Carter and I'm a, a Vice President for Technology Development at Ad Astra Rocket Company. Uh, I spent a lot of years working just right up the creek here, actually had a paddle, but uh, <laughs> right up here at Y-12 until we all got moved to the X-10 site, which I guess is now called the Oak Ridge, uh, well, Oak Ridge National Laboratory. But um, I started working with uh, the Ad Astra group while they were still part of NASA uh, under interagency agreements between Oak Ridge National Laboratory and, uh, and NASA. And so we did a lot of work on the plasma source to help get that started way back in the late 1990s. And it tied in with some uh, plasma work that's done for the fusion uh, business for how these waves actually get uh, propagated into the system and how you design the system to accept the waves that you can afford to, to um, produce. So uh, that also has some application here uh, on the ground for plasma sources for anything you need a plasma source for. So there's um, some people at Xtend still working on some of the stuff that, that we originally worked on for uh, Vasimir plasma sources. But um, anyway, uh, in 2006, I decided to go ahead and join uh, the group down in Houston. So they had money from private funding. We raised about $30 million, or I say we, uh, Franklin Chang Diaz raised about $30 million, uh, which helped us build a, a large vacuum chamber, which we really didn't have access to before that. And uh, we were able to purchase a, a superconducting magnet. It is a low temperature superconducting magnet, but that makes it actually um, the new technologies we couldn't afford in the time. And, and this would have been in probably 2008. And so uh, we built the, the cheaper version, but it's been great. Having a superconducting magnet is so much better than having to deal with, um, with, uh, with regular copper magnets. <laughs> that was almost impossible to deal with uh, the magnets themselves. But, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and, and get started. It looks like we have a pretty good sized group here. Um, so our flagship pro project really is the, uh, is the Vasimir engine that we're trying to develop. That's variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket that goes back a long time actually in, in terms of its, um, of its idea. The, uh, how you actually implement the idea has really uh, come about because of RF, radio frequency, uh, wave generation, broadcast radio basically tied into magnetized plasmas. So um, uh, we're the most advanced high power electric uh, rocket today. And when I mean high power, I mean more than 40 kilowatts. Below 40 kilowatts, you have better options in terms of mass from hull thrusters and ion engines. Above 40 kilowatts, we scale very well with increasing power because once you make the magnet, you can put more and more power through that magnet until you basically hit thermal limits. And so um, we can scale, we believe, all the way up to multi-megawatts. You see the same basic technologies being used in fusion experiments you know, in this country, although a lot of those are shutting down. But still, in Europe, for the large experiments uh, in Europe for fusion, they run multi-megawatt systems, very similar uh, wave physics involved. The design is electrodeless. Everything is done with electromagnetic coupling, so you don't have to separate the electrons and the ions to accelerate the ions. The waves, the natural waves that set up in the plasma do that for you if you exploit the, the physics and the properties of it correctly. Um, it um, really um, doesn't care what propellant you use too much. We like to use noble gases just because they're easier in the lab to deal with, and things like argon are relatively abundant throughout the, uh, the um, well, certainly on Earth and at Mars and different places. And so that's what we've chosen. It provides a good specific impulse of around four to 5,000 seconds, uh, which is kind of what you want for cislunar and, and Mars. And it's cheap. Uh, the, um, uh, we have um, also the ability to adapt by making more plasma and accelerating more plasma with less energy in the booster section. It's a two-stage rocket. You can actually adjust the, uh, the specific impulse with a fixed a gas without having to change gas. And that gives you a little bit of range in specific impulse depending on what you want to do with your mission. Uh, so that's some of the advantages of this technology. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, these engines exploit the natural resonant modes in the plasma. So in these modes, we choose by design, actually. You, um, 
you want to, uh, any electrical power source will work. We use DC input because we're gearing towards um, solar panels for the first power systems. And so we don't really care whether it's nuclear or, or solar or worth what the electric power source is, but it is electrical, uh, electric rocket. Uh, many types of, of um, propellants we've tested. We haven't tested actually iodine, but there's no reason why it shouldn't work. But we've tested all the rest of them in uh, source and some with acceleration. Um, the necessary technologies are already available. Uh, radio frequency solid state amplifiers from broadcast radio now are, are most impressive. Uh, and what they can do even now with some of the newer generation of, um, of FETs is, is really incredible. You can get 95 plus percent conversion efficiency to the waves that we want. And so when you're tuned, everything is, is very efficient in taking the electrical power and getting it in, actually into the plasma. We do use superconducting magnets. We've been using them since 2010. It's uh, different than most. Uh, it's similar to the MRI magnets that you see in the hospitals. It's uh, just under two Tesla maximum field. And it is conduction cooled. It's, uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't have liquid helium sloshing around it. It actually has cold heads that attach and conductively pull the power out, which is an important technology for space. You really don't want liquid helium running around, you know, loose <laughs> in your system. Um, we are, have been doing, looking at high temperature superconducting design since 2011. There's a company uh, in New York uh, called Superpower, connected to New York, that have been building uh, commercial versions of high temperature superconducting magnets. And um, that material's come a long way. It's now come down in price so that it's, it's actually competitive, and we've got designs and, and plans to build them as soon as we can get funding for that. It's probably our next big push to get funding is, is for that magnet. And you can see down here at the bottom that we've been doing uh, from actually starting at Oak Ridge with some of the high performance computers here, we've been doing some types of um, plasma simulations showing how the waves are launched and, and propagate and absorb inside the plasma from the get-go. This is back to 2007, very early experiments we did in NASA. And here's the, the downstream end. We, we measured the performance of the plasma by passing uh, targets through the system that have strain gauges so we can measure the, the actual force locally and get um, spatial resolution for the, for the profiles here too. So this we've advanced quite a bit. In the old days we had these a little bit too close. If you leave them position fixed in fixed position, <laughs> you'll burn up your probes. The heat flux coming out here is pretty impressive. Uh, and so uh, we've moved to systems further back that's raster through <clears throat> and they have time then to cool back off before they uh, before they become obliterated. Um, <clears throat> there's a picture of our vacuum chamber that we bought all with, uh, this is all purchased with private funding, but you can see people standing here. This is Aiden and Matt <laughs> working on the system. This is a control bank for current sewer superconducting magnet. We run about 40 amps through a little tiny wire. Uh, it, it's really pretty impressive uh, how that works. You can see just a little bit of the plasma here in the background through this porthole. I've kind of uh, covered it up with the words here, but um, this is part of a, a next step project with NASA. <clears throat> We've been doing it for, the, we're at the end of the third year for this project and, and hoping to get uh, advanced on to the, to the um, fourth year uh, support for that. Uh, we have completed 100 hours of operation with this system at 100 kilowatts. We didn't do it all continuously. There's a lot of facility issues. I, I didn't really respect how hard it was to do an experiment with 100 kilowatts inside a vacuum chamber. Everything that goes in has to come out. Plus, you have about 100 kilowatts driving the pumping systems for this, for this system. So there's a lot of problems with leaks. You, have, um, you can't really see, but right behind here is the manifolds that lead all the water cooling and, and systems that we have in there. We have um, run it with all those systems. We do run 50 kilowatts. Uh, we have run 50 kilowatts steady state. And we're fighting a little bit of a leak right now. We were supposed to be starting up, and we did start up last week to actually try to execute this 100-hour test. Uh, but we're going to have to pull it and fix that. It's really a seep. It's so small that it doesn't stop us at 50 or, or 70 uh, kilowatts even. But to go to 100 kilowatts, it starts to make uh, water plasmas. And so <laughs> it's the leaks and seeps that actually get you, not the, not the plasma physics and, and nothing else and, or like that. So the system really is full-blown TRL-4 and, and getting very close to TRL-5 by the time we get finished with these tests. 
which is the valley of death for, uh, for development. So, <laughs> so we're, all, we're always looking for money. We hope to get private funding, and we have a lot of private funding. This is about a $10 million investment from NASA. And I, as I say, we've, we've raised about $30 million in private investment. Um, we have new PPUs. Our PPUs are actually very simple systems compared to other electric propulsion systems because these waves basically are linear waves. They, there's some quasi-linear effects in that you get slow changes because of power and things like that, but you don't have any real instabilities that you have to fight, like you have to fight when you separate the system out uh, in, in what I would call an unnatural mode. Uh, plasmas don't like to be separated. <laughs> they like to stay, but they, they will jig on and oscillate. Um, and we have uh, performance measurements that are better than 60% system-wide efficiency, and we believe we can improve that even further by going to um, things like the high-temperature superconducting magnet systems. The, the refrigerators are a lot smaller, and you have a lot less loss in the system. Um, this is really a paradigm shift in, in how you would do space transportation because everybody says high power. Well, what does high power mean? <laughs> Some people would say 10 kilowatts is high power, and I would say, no, that's, that's not by our standards. We really are looking at 100 kilowatt systems, which are similar to what you use for transportation in your vehicle. I mean, we're human-sized um, creatures. We have to have human-sized things, and that means you're in 100 kilowatts for transportation systems. It's kind of amazing how that works. It doesn't matter whether you're on the freeway or in space. Um, we um, are looking at commercial applications, uh, everything from robotic to human uh, transportation. Because we do scale to high power, we're of interest to human, but the money in the commercial side is much more on the uh, cislunar and, and satellite servicing, things like that. So that's where most of our interest is actually for the commercial development. Uh, but we can, we do enable pretty much exploration from low Earth all the way to Jupiter and even beyond. And so there, there are several interesting things that you can do. Uh, here's just a brief technology development thing. It's, it's been a slow slug going from a private company in 2005 uh, all the way to where we are now. And we now have these designs that we're basically testing the components for in the system that we have now to go ahead and implement into a flight uh, demonstration project, which, uh, which we hope to fly something around 2022 if we can keep the funding rolling. We do have partnerships. We have uh, this $10 million three-year partnership with NASA Next Step, and we hope that can continue on. We're also working with a small company in Canada with the assistance of the Canadian Space Agency to develop these uh, PPUs. They have industrial applications too, so, so they're developing them really as a product. Uh, which we'll buy from them, and then the Canadian Space Agency will help us take it on to TRL-6. Uh, TRL-6 basically is where you start to fly, or you're ready to test your flight test. Um, Northrop Grumman is also helping with a, a flight uh, demo proposal, so we're looking at things like Espa Grandes and things like that to fly on and integrate with. Uh, we'll be doing a solar-powered you know, unit with battery uh, backup, or basically battery energy storage, so that you can build up to your 150 kilowatt level, which we would like to test the engine at for a single string, discharge the batteries, and then recharge them. So the solar arrays are still pretty expensive, but they do have these available. Orbital ATK, which uh, Northrop Grumman purchased, actually has arrays that will go to that level. And there's also another company um, that, that develops arrays, and we don't really care what arrays we use, whichever package is the best, and we can afford to launch. Um, Applications for the technology, uh, space station reboost is something that we've been looking at for a long time. You have to basically keep lifted up, and it, we spend a lot of um, a lot of propellant right now trying to keep the space station reboosted. And you have to pay the Russians for that. Um, so it'd be nice to be able to have this system, which you could run. You know, the argon supply would last a long, long time, and just solar power. You, you need about 50 to 80 kilowatts uh, to basically boost and have good control over your. Um, you want to be able to boost and also maybe maintain zero G in different in different environments. And it wouldn't have to be for ISS. Anybody that has a space station will need to do something like this in low orbit. Um, satellite servicing, I think we can do a lot with robotics. You can go move around. Plane changes and things like that are easy for electric propulsion compared to chemical. So you can do lots of applications that way. Um, the um, space resources and mining, certainly going and getting an asteroid. We're, we're the truck. Uh, if you want to go get an asteroid, we can help. <laughs> the, um, at least we're the engine for the truck. The, uh, 
fast planetary human transport is what we're also interested in too and the, and the power scaling up to do that. So that's, that's uh, what I'm gonna be talking about mostly here. So just, I think everybody in this room pretty much understands this, but the specific impulse of chemical rockets is just too low for deep space. They're, they're great for getting off the ground, but their fuel requirements are very high if you just, you know, and the, the capacity is very low. So here's your payload and you even leave this and this is the only thing you come back in going to the moon. So this is all fuel, this is fuel, this is more fuel, and, and here's more fuel so you can get back. Uh, so you can see how the stack up is really against you, and this is just going to the moon. Uh, you start going to Mars, that's a much more difficult problem. Uh, and so an Apollo-style architecture for deep space just isn't sustainable. You could probably do it, but it's more like a stunt. Um, if you want to really do it, you need an efficient and reusable architecture. And basically, energy is what drives the system. Physics requires energy to do anything <laughs> in space. And so you can imagine this architecture you launch to some sort of a transfer orbit. A tug would pick up your, your payload and carry it to the moon or orbit around the moon for its, whatever it's supposed to do. Or it could take it all the way to Mars, and, and you can then reuse this tug. So you bring the tug back, reload it, and hopefully you could make, you know, dozens of trips to the moon and at least you know several you know many trips you can only do these trips to mars about every couple two and a half years just on the synodic cycle but you don't want to be restricted to closest approach and things like that you want to be able to go every two and a half years no matter what the alignments are and these types of tugs will allow you to do that taking large cargoes you can actually amplify your payloads by a huge amount so that you can get um, very large cargo deliveries to Mars. It, they're, they're fairly slow, but you can do that with solar power. If you just uh, a little bit of um, interesting facts is that a 200 kilowatt solar array provides about 60 terajoules of, of energy in space over a 10 year lifetime. <clears throat> and so you can piggyback that and get that up with a medium lift launcher. It's, it's easy to get in space uh, by today's launch standards. Um, a 500 or 5,000 tons of chemical fuel with oxidizer provide about the same amount of total energy. So that gives you some kind of a clue about how much this power supply, in situ power supply for solar is worth. Uh, nuclear energy, of course, is, is much more dense than chemical to the point where it doesn't really matter, but it really only helps you if you can reuse it. You really have to make sure that these systems are reusable or else the cost is just gonna drive you, uh, you won't be able to sustain it. So reusability is a real big, uh, real big um, thing in this whole thing if we want to become sustainable. So a little bit about what uh, humans would have to deal with uh, going to Mars. You know, first question is how much risk are you willing to tolerate? You have a lot of complexity for mission assembly. You'd probably be assembling something close to lunar orbit so that you could take off there without having to fight the gravity wells. Uh, you have to worry about deep space radiation, and so you have time and shielding uh, to, you can't do anything about distance because this stuff is coming from all over the place, but, um, but you have to worry about radiation if you're in space, especially deep space. The Apollo astronauts would see streaks through their eyes and things like that from galactic cosmic radiation and other things. They're pretty sure that's what it was. Or even protons for the sun can be a problem. So you really want to minimize the time you spend in travel before you get to some sort of shelter. Um, you can carry some, some mass with you for shielding, but these, th this type of radiation you're trying to shield against is very difficult to screen out. It takes a lot of mass to do that and you don't really want to do that. So time is your friend here. You want to, or it's your enemy. You want to, you want to make short time to, to um, solve the problem. Zero gravity is also a big problem. If you have enough equipment with you, you can sort of offset that. But if you go longer than about six months in space, it starts to cause a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of problem. I've watched my neighbor who came back from the ISS after six months. And, it took him two or three months before he could push his child in a stroller. So if you're gonna to get to Mars and, and land on the ground and be able to actually function, the gravity's lower there, but you're still gonna have a hard time unless you get there again quickly and can maintain your health along the way. And we have sort of a fundamental thing. My, my boss is an astronaut, you, you saw him speak yesterday, but he really wants to come back. And I find that most astronauts would, would prefer to come back. Going a one-way trip is exciting for some people, but, <laughs> but man, it's, it's just not something we want to do. So we always try to plan, you know, on how you would return. And, and so what are your options for round trip? And you have, you have several different things. You can, you can integrate everything for the return trip at departure, which will be the way things probably are gone if you try to do it early before you build a lot of infrastructure around Mars. 
So, so this is something that's important to look at, and it's also relatively low risk because you, you integrate everything in a place where you can test it before you even leave. Um, you could also preposition your return propellant in Mars orbit or make it in situ or however you do that. If you preposition, you're going to have to take a lot of cargo uh, ahead of time, and then you'll have a lot of added risk for assembly at Mars, which will have to be pretty much all robotic. I don't think you can, it's too slow a communication delay to do anything <clears throat> except that, really. Uh, which means you need a bunch of satellite infrastructure and, and control stuff probably at Mars, too, before you can do that. Or you can get this propellant by in situ, but this is way on down the line before you, you have to have a lot of infrastructure in place. You, you know, the, it's nice to have these lakes around here, but somebody had to build the dam before, <laughs> before you could use the lake. Um, and so I'm going to look a little bit at what technologies can improve the odds for this. And so... NASA's already done a really nice job of what it really would take to get a habitat that people could live in for something like a six-month period. And it's this design reference architecture five. I'm not going to exactly follow their method for getting there, but, um, but they do specify a, ton, uh, a, a, a habitat would weigh about 65 tons. That's sort of the same size as a space shuttle type thing, something like that, which would give people enough to, room to have exercise equipment, be able to get away from each other. If you put too many people in too small of a place, they'll just kill each other. It's kind of a known fact. <laughs> uh, so you don't want that either. So um, I want to look at propulsion options that are TRL-4-ish or, or better. And so certainly we have locked hydrogen engines. They, they are great systems. Uh, but they only have specific impulse of like 420 seconds. That's the number I'm going to be using in my in my slides. It doesn't make a lot of difference. It's low. You have NERVA 2-like uh, propulsion systems that were developed for the Saturn um, upper stages, and they have specific specific impulse of about 850 seconds that maybe can go a little bit higher, but again, that's the ballpark. You can then switch to nuclear. I, I should say also solar here, but solar probably doesn't give you enough power to take people, so I'm looking really at nuclear electric. There you can get specific impulse ranges from 2,000 seconds up to 6,000 seconds or even higher uh, if, if you need that. And you also want to look at aero capture. People are looking at aero capture a lot. It does help save. You don't have to have propellant because you have to stop. You can't just go and, and, and not stop. <laughs> you just keep on going uh, when, you, when you go to Mars. Um, and so there, there's two fundamentally different things going on here. Okay. One, one is that uh, LOX hydrogen and, and, and nuclear thermal are propellant intensive because they're low ISP. Nuclear electric and aero capture are plant intensive because you have to build the infrastructure into the rocket itself, and, and they use a lot less propellant, or, or effectively almost none. So you need to do fast travel times to Mars. Uh, minimum energy transfers really don't count. So what I did was I just did a simple race. You basically just start and cover the radial distance between the orbits. It's about, on average, 77 million kilometers. You want to be able to do that every two and a half years. Sometimes it's going to be faster when you're closer. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, further when, it's, when you're not lined up, right? But you still want to have this sustainable uh, cadence. Uh, and you just do a simple race. You, you accelerate, you know, you coast, and then you decelerate, and then you carry enough stuff or have enough infrastructure to get back. And um, so you need to get there in less than six months. Uh, you can go look at things like uh, assembly uh, things. Uh, there's about a 92% chance, according to this paper, of successful integration for each launch with SLS at, uh, uh, at the moon. That can probably be improved and probably will be. That's a little bit older, uh, older paper. But you assume that you position all this, this material you know, in lunar orbit, and then you have different propulsive uh, mechanisms for getting in, aero capture, or having your prepositioned return stuff. And again, tugs can help with prepositioning early on in the infrastructure. And what you find out is that, that NEP is fast for all the cases that I considered here, that's nuclear electric propulsion. The nuclear thermal propulsion is marginally fast if you have five kilometer per second aero capture. So here we have LOX hydrogen, which, which really can't get you back. <laughs> it, it's it's uh, marginal no matter what you have, so you really are colonizing here. Um, if you go nuclear thermal, you can actually, if you add aero capture, can get close to six months, uh, basically acceleration, deceleration times, one-way transits. Um, uh, but the nuclear electric gives you the ISP and gets you away from this. Uh, it gets you down the exponential in the rocket equation and, and allows you to go. And so I'm looking at, uh, I think, um, 
we saw yesterday somebody was mentioning, uh, you know, 10 kilogram per kilowatt was pretty straightforward. Uh, four kilogram per kilowatt is, is hard, but, but does gain you something for electric uh, propulsion. Uh, and, and this is fairly realizable. Several people will say you can do this. Uh, this one is harder, but some people, I think Lennard yesterday said that he might even be able to do this or better. So, so this is not crazy if you actually go ahead and invest in, in the development for electric power plants. Plus you have a nice electric power source once you get there. It doesn't have to be used just for propulsion. And so if you, if you do risk optimization and weight this thing by the extra risk you have to put in place by prepositioning at Mars, this is a, you, you have to do this um, kind of crudely. So I did this just simply by how many extra launches you have to have to get to Mars. And, and you find that you, you really do win by going nuclear electric. Uh, and you also see uh, the power sizes are not as big as you might think when you optimize these, these times. It's very simple. You can go program this on an Excel spreadsheet. But you really want 100 to 200 megawatt thermal type reactors, which are good matches for 20% conversion efficiency to nuclear electric. So the same reactor might be able to be used for both uh, very effectively. Um, but they're not as big as NERVA. You don't want the full-size NERVA reactor. That's like having a giant dragster engine on your truck. You know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense altogether. And SEP cargo staging, I think, really is an important first step. You can do, it saves a lot of costs going to the moon. So it saves staging costs. You could also then use this to get something like 30 tons to Mars every year based on SLS launches. So SEP, I think, is, is definitely a technology that's ready and ripe to be exploited. Uh, we just need the, the engines that can use that power, and it steps right on into the nuclear realm as, as you go. So I'm getting close to the hook here. Um, let's see, I, I guess the conclusions here, I don't have a lot of time, but you know, NEP is the only technology that really allows fast transits on a two and a half year cadence. Uh, aero capture will, if you, if you do it propulsively, the, the lowest risk option. Aero capture definitely helps. It, it makes uh, nuclear thermal become marginally fast, but it adds this critical maneuver on arrival. Aero capture is not easy. <laughs> um, the uh, pre preposition propellant requires a huge amount of infrastructure. You're going to have to already have cargo systems and other things in place before you can really start to do this type of work. And so it's nice to envision all this stuff and what you can do after it's there, but you've got to build that infrastructure to begin with. Um, and solar electric uh, cargo, I think, is really where we have to get started. And that's all I have.